Welcome to Modern Alchemy, episode number 63, and this is one of those rare occasions where we have a spotlight, Yes, and we have a very, very special guest uh, today, um, ha- happens to be one of one of my teachers, mentors, and one great friends. James' mentor. Yes. Um, stood <laughs> with me through the storm Yes, when so many people did not. Um I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> um, but great appreciation and love for this man and respect. And so anyway, um, Genpo Roshi is the highest ranking Zen monk outside of Japan. And as far as I know, unless that's changed, <laughs> but, but at this point, it's probably just one of, <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. Oh, there's more and more, uh, Recognized, I was the third recognized by Japan. There was Baker Roshi and Tetsugen Glassman Roshi and myself and third. But now there are many more, I'm sure. Yeah. I have a track, but there are others. Well, you're still the highest ranking one in our book. Um, so well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's our pleasure. So anyway, help help us in welcoming uh Genpo Roshi and and what I would like to start off with, uh, Genpo is well, tell us tell us what your name means because I know the name Gimpo is a is a is a an earned name, and there's there's meaning to that, and maybe you could share that. Okay, so my full name, of course, is Dennis Merzel, but my Dharma names are Soten Denpo, and then the title is Roshi. So Roshi is the title; that's the honorific. The rest is a name. So in 1973, in fact, June. Uh, in 1973, so you can do the math, 50 years ago, uh, I was given two names at my Jukai, and that's where you receive the precepts. So you become officially a uh, Buddhist, receiving the precepts, and the precepts are kind of guidelines of how you live your life, not to kill, not to steal, not to do harm, uh, not to be, yeah, many, many things that you shouldn't do. Uh, and <clears throat> he gave me two names, Soten, which is what you call uh, an Inca name. Inca means final seal of approval. Now, it was rare that he gave both names uh, when you received your Kai. I don't know how many he did, but uh, I think it was less than a handful, if even that. Uh, and that means he said, I'll be eventually giving you the final seal of approval, but not yet. That was 1973. <laughs> And he didn't do it until 1980, seven years later. Wow. Did I deserve it? Not yet. <laughs> so Ten is a pretty amazing name. So means patriarch or ancestor. We always called them back in the day patriarchs, but now it's got a little bit of a bad name, bad rep. So we call them ancestors most of the time. So the so means an ancestor, and ten is heaven. And Gen is esoteric, and Po is Dharma. Mm. So it's patriarch, heaven, of esoteric Dharma. Wow. Hidden, hidden or secret Dharma. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's really uh, a big name. <laughs> and I never even felt uh, that I felt I could even use the Soten, because together it's just too much. Until about a year ago. Oh, wow. And it was only a year ago that something opened up in me that made me feel uh, okay about using that name because it always seemed a little too much. (laughs) Can can you tell us what that was? Are you you feel comfortable with Well, yeah, it was a dropping away of the attachment to the form and the tradition of Zen Buddhism. Hmm. So, in other words, we have uh, a kind of understanding that everything that we learn, everything that we have experienced, everything that we know gets us to this moment. And I'm sure you and all your listeners understand that. That if anything different had happened any time in our past, we wouldn't be here now. We'd be someplace else. 
but not here. Right. So when we see that, we also see the perfection. Not just the emptiness, but the perfection of life itself. In other words, we normally look at life as a glass half empty. Even if we're someone who looks at the glass as half full, it's still half empty. (laughs) That's true. Because we don't see the perfection of life. Mm -hmm. What Zen is, first we have to see the emptiness. And the emptiness means that all our thoughts, all our feelings, all our emotions, all our ideas, all our notions, all our understanding is still temporary. There's nothing permanent about any of it. Mm -hmm. That means it's empty of nature. It's not solid. It's not substantial. It's empty in its nature, meaning it's like bubbles that rise to the surface of the water, and then they pop. Each bubble is an identity, is a self. So like there's three of us right now, I see you two and myself, we're three bubbles. Now, how long does a bubble last on the surface of, let's say, the water? Not too long. That's our life length of our life. And that bubble pops and we return to the water or the sea or the ocean, or the river. So we are like a bubble, and to see that is already a state of enlightenment. But it's not a very advanced state, it's a kind of initial state. We call it the raising of the body mind, the mind that seeks the way to understand if my life is empty, then what is the meaning? What's the purpose? Now, it turns out the purpose and the meaning is what we give to it. And that all has to do always with service. Mm. If there's any meaning in life, it's serving something greater than oneself, right? We all know that. Would you say say this this, uh, uh, first understanding of the bubble, I I like the metaphor, is more intellectual versus... No, no, it's actually not intellectual at all. It's a rising of the body mind. In other words, and I'm sure you both have had it, and that is in one moment, life is as it is, and the next moment you see it's empty. Mm -hmm. Everything that you thought was you is no longer seen as you. It's just added to the real you. The real you or the original you is what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two ways to get there. One is to realize our original nature, And the other is to stop looking for it and be our original nature. In other words, our original nature is basically good. It's compassionate. It's loving. It's understanding. It's non-judgmental. Our original understanding before we develop this egocentric self is very compassionate and very seeing things as they are. We see things just as they are. We don't add to them or subtract anything from them. We don't judge them. We don't evaluate. We just see things as they are. A Buddha is one who sees things as they are. Most of us have some kind of, you know, agenda in what we see, and it's discolored, or we're looking through colored lenses or shattered lenses, and we don't see it. So that's very important. But another deeper understanding is to see the perfection which is the same, it's the same kind of experience. It's of our true nature, if what we call in Buddhism, shunyata, emptiness. But this time the emptiness is full. It's perfect, complete, and it's whole. So there's nothing extra and nothing missing. Mm. So we appreciate our life from that place and all lives from that place that we are all doing our very best but it doesn't always look that way. (laughs) And everything that we do, if we take away the discriminating, judgmental mind, everything is just as it is. And that is perfect, complete, and whole. So, 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 yeah, going back. That's a lot. lot. Going back to um, one of the things you said, Bishop and I, and, and and I don't know the answer to this question. You can, and as long as we've known each other, I, I know that you're Jewish by by birth. Were you raised in the Judaic no. tradition? No. No. No, I had absolutely zero education in Judaism. Now, my father had been raised Jewish. 
Mm. And he had been raised in a rabbinical school until he was 10 in Poland. And then he came to this country. But his father left just before the war broke out. And then they were separated for 10 years during the war. His father gave up the religion. He was raised as a rabbi. He was trained as a rabbi. Uh, he went back to that much later in life. It's the only time I have ever, twice I've been in a temple. And that was the only time other than a wedding. <laughs> was my <laughs> grandfather doing the ceremony. Your and father I, was a rabbi or your grandfather was a rabbi? My grandfather. My grandfather. Gotcha. And you know the temple. I'm sure you do. Do I? Yeah. It's on, <laughs> it's on Venice Beach. It's that funny colored one. I think it's blue. Mm. You know it? You ever been on Venice Beach? Yeah. yeah. It was his temple. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, yeah. the reason I brought up uh, the, the the Jewish piece is because yeah. we were listening. Um, there's, a, there's a man by the name of Dennis Prager, who I don't know if you're familiar, uh, but he's yeah. – He's um, he's Jewish and he's very steeped in the tradition. And he was saying that he um, and I don't know if this is Judaic thought or if it's just Dennis Prager's thought, but he was saying that he doesn't believe people are necessarily naturally good. They mm -hmm. need to be trained to be good. Now, you stated and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You stated a moment ago that our our Buddha nature, if you will, is naturally good. Mm -hmm. So, so I'd love to hear your answer. Yeah, if you think of uh, uh, ocean and different levels of depth, mm -hmm. he's talking about one level. I'm just talking about another. At the very deepest level, our nature happens to be no nature. Mm. The way this no nature manifests is basically good. Basically. I mean, we have we want to do good. Now, all kinds of things at that level come up and we don't do good. So if you say that's our basic nature, he's right. But there is a level deeper, I'm afraid, or would like to say. And at that level, it's not good or bad, right or wrong. There's no good, there's no bad. But when it manifests, in our life, it manifests as a basic goodness, a mm. basic caring for the sake of others. Basically, if you put two people together, of course, they can go to war and kill each other, or they can find a peaceful coexistence where it's basically good. That's there, but it could get covered up by other aspects. Mm. So I don't argue with him. That's fine. It's just a different degree of depth that we're talking about. That's all. Yeah, I I was just curious coming yeah. from a Buddhist standpoint, yeah. and and I also I was thinking about our time together today, yesterday, and I was thinking, you know, I don't really know a whole lot about Gempo's uh, upbringing, whether he came up in in Judaic tradition or not. And now now obviously you've answered that. Um, so I got a question that came up when uh, you were explaining some of the stuff. You 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 said that your thoughts and feelings, um, they they all at some point that all becomes temporary too. Um, my question is, my understanding thus far, <laughs> in the small amount of life experience I've had, is um doesn't your wis isn't that your wisdom and or okay so is your wisdom also temporary too? I have no wisdom. Are you assuming I have wisdom? But I mean, do you see, do you, does my question? I, I think she was sense? saying the universal you, Gimbo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Sure. I'm saying like, because you go through life, you, you experience all these things and you learn and you're supposed to expand and grow. So I'll accumulate all of that to uh, someone's wisdom or understanding. Okay. I get your question now. So I see there are two kinds of wisdom. There's a conventional wisdom. Mm. That's what you're talking about. So as we grow and we mature, we gain wisdom. You know, we go through life and experiences. And I'm sure both of you are not the same people I met 10 years ago or 12 years ago, right? <laughs> I don't remember how long it's been there, but I think it's been about 10 years. Six, yeah, I think it, six, six no, years. No, it's been closer. More. Been, yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Okay, and I've, and, and I've known James for longer, 
Uh, yeah. We met with Bill Harris back, uh, I don't know, the 2008 or seven or six or something. Six, seven, yeah. yeah. Six, seven, right. We've all learned since then and gained in wisdom, but there is an innate wisdom which is ungraspable, which you only can find if you go deep within yourself. That is really the foundation of it all. And that, what we find, has no substance. It's what allows everything to be as it is. In other words, alive and present. So because of that unfixed nature, or you could say flow of nature, everything has life. Without that, everything would be solid and we'd have no universe as we know it. It would just be, right? So this, it's the yin and yang of Chinese understanding. Mm -hmm. So if one is solid, the other one's flowing. Uh -oh. Okay? If one's negative, the other's positive. If one's good, the other's bad. Whatever we have on one side of the equation, we have to look at the other side. So what I meet are a lot of people that have very, very, very clear understanding of life, but it's one-sided. I rarely meet anybody who can flip to the other side just as easily and see the other perspective. Now, Zen is a lot about that. Because let's say we're in an argument, Bear and I, and you're saying one thing and I'm saying another thing, right? I can flip very easily and see it from your perspective because I'm not holding tightly to being right, that wow. my understanding is the right understanding. This is the freedom that very few get to because we're so stuck in being right, in knowing, in understanding. So about a year, year and a half ago, and I said something happened back February, March, one of the things I had to do was make a decision. I didn't have to. I did. I made a decision in a very deep state whether to try to know and understand if I go in for this surgery, will I live through it? Because I, I had a good chance that I wouldn't live through it. There was good reason to know I might not live through it, but I didn't know. So I asked my wife, Jigen Roshi, Jigen, uh, Charlotte, I asked her to work with me on this. I said, Find in me the deepest wisdom so I know whether to go in for the surgery tomorrow or not. And she asked me, and I went very, very deep, very quickly. I dropped into not knowing. But I had to make a choice. Would I rather know what to do or would I rather live? Because if I choose going in for the surgery, I could die. Or I could live. I don't know. If I don't go in for the surgery, I know I'm going to live. I just might have cancer. Mm. Mm. I chose to not know, but I did it not just for that. I made a decision to choose not knowing and not understanding life itself over knowing and understanding, which is not life, I'm sorry. It's just knowing and it's understanding. It's not life. We think knowing and understanding is life. It's not life. Life is over here. And knowing and understanding is over here. So I made the choice to go here rather than be here. Would, that changed everything. Would it be wow. fair to call that um, so did surrender I, or or yeah. Faith? yeah, but it's a very, very deep surrender, not to know, but just trust. Right. That okay. whatever is going to be will be. Yeah. But it's not blind faith either because you still – have agency you still can make effort but you don't need to know or understand like that's not your epitome <laughs> i i want to understand life no you're never going to understand life it's ungraspable you but me? you can be life but you can be it <laughs> but you can be it right you what can a, live it one of Beersheba's primary objectives oh. is to know God. And, you know, in the Kabbalistic tradition, <laughs> they say you can't I'm know being high. You can't know God. You can experience God, but knowing exists in 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 the conscious mind. And you, may I do something? Yeah. Bear, bear. May uh, I may I speak? 
Yes. To a voice. To what? Oh, I'm sorry. What? To a voice. May I speak to a voice? Ooh, okay. <laughs> yes. Are you ready? Sure. Oh, I'm ready. I'd like to speak to God. Oh, man. How do you okay. Do stay stay with that. Stay with that. Oh. Stay with that. Okay. What's coming up? Uh, what? <laughs> That what's, what's coming up? Let's see. Yeah, I don't feel it. Okay, so the I don't. I it's it's a worthiness. I guess I I don't. I can't. I can't say that because <laughs> I don't feel that I. That's even in my ballpark. I guess. Okay. Okay. I get that. Can I speak to the honorable one? Uh, okay. <laughs> I can you can speak that. You can do that one, right? Yes. I'm the honorable one. I'm the honorable okay. one. Yes. Yeah. Are you owned or not owned? Does she really acknowledge you that I am the honorable one? I am really worthy of honor. No. No. So would you like to be owned and powered by Bear to be honorable? Yes. Of course. Yes. Okay. So... What do you need from her to help you feel empowered to be worthy of honor and respect? Mm, trust comes up. What does? Trust. Faith. Trust. 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 Absolutely. You need her. That's bare. She's separate from you, right? We're doing the big mind process for those that don't know. And you need her to trust you. What else do you need from her? That's very good. To have faith. Yes, have faith. To trust you, have faith in you. What else? Mm, trust the process. Trust the process. What else? I can tell you my mother's favorite, a little goddamn respect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah accept accept acceptance for sure yes yeah yeah I mean, maybe some respect yes yes okay so let's see can i speak to fear for a moment fear yes i i am fear okay do you have any fear of allowing this voice the honorable one to be empowered by bear to be owned embodied and empowered by her to be worthy of respect and honor. I, mm, you have any fear? No. You're afraid she might get inflated or mm. you know, beyond herself or feel sure, phony. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I would say that's a that's a that's a fear. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So say more about that fear. I would say um, I would be afraid that she would get carried away with herself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what do you need to kind of convince you that it's okay? Mm. Mm. What do I need? You know, it, it goes, it, it's going to the feeling of, um, to to have that uh, ultimate trust, I guess that trust, the faith. It goes back to the trust and have faith in the process. Yeah, that's maybe maybe we should speak to faith first. <laughs> what do you think? To faith. Uh, May I speak to faith? Sure. Okay. Yes. I'm going to call you unconditional faith. Oh. Okay. Oh. Wow. <laughs> that's a big one. Okay. I, what do you mean? A big one. That's you. I am unconditional faith. I am unconditional faith. Tell me about you. When you look at Bear, when you look at her. Mm, unconditional faith. You are. Mm. What does that mean? That you have unconditional faith in her? Uh, what I get is, you know, the... Um, the 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 how the process of life i guess is the best way i could i could say it yeah. as it feels yeah is um 
yeah I, I i feel like in from this place that it would be uh what's the word there it, there would be no need for the fear of that's right carried away with yourself that's right that's right yeah if you are unconditional phase that means you just trust what is am i right Yes. Okay, so let me speak to you, owned, embodied, and empowered, because I don't think there's any fear about empowering you, is there? No. <laughs> okay, so who are you? I am faith. Absolute faith? Was that what it was? Yes. Well, it's unconditional, but absolute. That's right. I am unconditional faith, fully embodied and accepted. Owned and empowered. Owned, owned and, empowered. and empowered. Okay, now let's just sit for a moment. And just get in touch with you. Explore your parameters. I am unconditional, great faith, absolute faith. I trust everything unconditionally to be what it is. Not what Bear thinks it should be. I know that she has these ideas how it should be. But I just trust everything is what it is. Perfect, complete, and it's whole. Mm. It's a uh, it's a very uh, expansive feeling. It's it's liberating, is what it is. Isn't it? Isn't it? Stay with it. Okay. It's very liberating. Mm. It it's freeing. It's it's almost you know. It's not almost. It is. It's coming from a space of. It's wholesome. Um, and, and a belief in, yeah, faith. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, I thank you. <laughs> now may I speak to the one who is honorable. Okay. I am the one who's honorable. Owned, embodied, and fully empowered. Owned, embodied, and fully empowered. Okay, just be with that for a minute. You are worthy of honor and respect. I'm the honorable. I am the world honorable one. I am the honorable one. That's who you are. Yeah, that, that's wow. It fit. It feels. Uh, it feels. Uh, feels like it's rooted in the same, from from the uh, unconditional faith. That's what we call Buddha nature. That which you said, it feels like it's rooted in. Yeah, that's uh, our true nature. Yeah. It's rooted in the source of who we are. The source of all of this. It's yeah. all one. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Very good job. Oh, thank you. That was the best. I'm done. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> didn't expect that on a no, podcast. No, I did, did not. You? Yeah. I'm sure our listeners would love that. Yeah. That that's... was amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. So, yes, thank you. You you just <laughs> you just gave me a new wife. I'm I'm very <laughs> Uh, or a new well, derivation, uh, at least. Of, of, or maybe a new teacher. <laughs> well, that's true as well. That's true, too. That's all true. So, so um, you know, this, this podcast is called Modern Alchemy, and, and, yeah. and alchemy cool. is, is the art and science of transmutation, which is which basically... Did that. <laughs> well, yeah, we, didn't we? And, yes. and so... Um, Transmutation, taking something that is here and, and turning it into something completely different. Yeah. I think we just did that. <laughs> I I would agree. And I, I would love to know additional, <laughs> additional Buddhist thoughts on that concept of of transmutation. Is that is that from Zen? Yeah. Is that from your experience? <laughs> or both and yeah. 
Yes. Both hands. It's both hands. <laughs> so, so why I'm laughing is, and I know in a podcast you got to do this, but you're asking me to kind of talk about it rather than show and demonstrate what it is. Mm-hmm. So it's like, here's the real thing, and here, let's talk about something else. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that is that, what I just did is pure Zen. Now, I used a technique that I've developed over the last 25 years, let's say, 30 years, called the Big Mind Technique, which I've kind of perfected. But that's all that was. That's pure Zen. I just went to the essence of Zen. And rather than having to sit for 20 or 30 years to realize what Bear just realized, we did it in a few minutes. That's the difference. Pretty efficient. That's fascinating. It's very efficient. So I've spent since 1971 looking for a more efficient, a more radical way to bring around about enlightenment or awakening. And I went into traditional Zen, like I said, in 72, and I really went into it. I mean, I spent 50 years. I I think you're the one who told me 50 years is a life sentence. Am I right? Um, (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. I don't remember. I've told. Well, okay. I don't know if you told me. Somebody told me, well, 50 years is a life sentence. And I feel like I did a life sentence in traditional Zen Buddhism. And at some point, it was a raft. It was an upaya. It was a skillful means that got me to where I am. And so as I was saying uh, about rafts, that whatever rafts brings us to here, eventually we have to leave the raft back at the water and not carry it around on land. So once we go across whatever we're crossing over to, across the river, we get to the other side, we leave the raft behind. All teaching is that way. However, some teaching is more difficult to leave behind or drop than other teaching. The teaching that is most true and most real and most accurate is the hardest teaching to drop Mm -hmm. because we love real and right. But before we can get to real and right, we have to go beyond all conditions. That's what Bear did. Beyond all conditions, it's just deep faith of things as they are and a deep love and appreciation for things as they are. And this goes so far as people. Now, it doesn't mean we can't discriminate and say some people are this and some people are that. I don't want to be around this person. And I think this person has no right to be (laughs) around me. But that's different. Fundamentally, fundamentally, we're less judgmental and more accepting of others. But it doesn't mean we can't discriminate or have discerning wisdom and say, I don't want to spend all my time with this person. I want to spend more time with this person. Or I want to be spending more time doing this and less time doing that. Maybe I want to watch TV less and work on studies more. Hmm. So would you would you agree that maybe to put some some terms on that, it's a difference yeah. between understanding and agreement? I mean, you can you can understand someone and you don't have to necessarily agree with them, but you you have a an understanding and yeah. acceptance. So. What about the there's a couple of things I'd like to to ferret what you just said, the the raft. Could we call that practices? Yes. OK, so. But also more than that, practices, teachings, understanding and experience. Precepts, okay. principles, uh, or or no. Yes, and experience. And experiences. And understanding. So even oh. whatever whatever understanding I have this moment, okay, I have to let it go too. You know, my first dog, which her name was Tibby, she taught me something. She was a very young puppy. And we were walking in front of the Zen Center one day, and she had a bone in her mouth. And I wanted to give her a biscuit. So she looked up at me, saw the biscuit, looked in her mouth, saw the bone sticking out, looked at me, looked, dropped the bone, picked up the biscuit. You know how long it took me to drop the bone and pick up the biscuit? A lot longer <laughs> than Tibby. 80 years. <laughs> but, and but I'm not 80 yet. Uh... <laughs> you, got, you have a birthday coming up. I had it. I had it. Oh, you That's had it? 
yeah. last week. Yeah. Last week. Uh, yeah. Well, happy, happy belated happy birthday. Um, and and we are glad. We're really yeah. grateful that you made it through your your surgery that you were you were debating about. Yeah. I didn't take it. <laughs> oh, you didn't. You, you didn't, didn't go. No, it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Okay. So so that's what I wanted. To what know. I'd like you were going to ask him about. That? <laughs> yeah, I was like, so did you do it or did you not? Do it? Well, I did. I I did what I needed to do, which was uh, six months later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I felt safe then. I had taken care of the underlying problem that would have caused me probably to die. Mm, good for you. I was, I, I was bleeding too profusely. That's all. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I felt like I would not heal. I wouldn't. Yeah. I had good reason to believe I wouldn't make it through, but I had no assurance I would or wouldn't. So I decided to forget it. Yeah. So back to, to practices. If yeah. we kind of long yeah. experiences, yeah. practices, all that into one term. Um, how important is it when you're early on the path to focus on the practices, which you obviously absolutely, did? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. because what, what I yeah. find, and I, and I don't know if you have this in your experience, is that an, a lot of people want to cut right to the chase and, mm -hmm. and not build the foundation. Right. So you can't leave the raft until you've used the raft, I would guess. Right. Until you're on the shore, either. <laughs> right. Until you're on the other shore. Yeah. You don't give up the raft before you get there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give up the raft. No, you're in the middle of the lake. Okay. You don't do that. Well, a lot of what you're saying is about being real with oneself. Hmm. Have I even started the journey? Now, one of the things we find out with enlightenment is we realize we hadn't even started until this moment. But that happens over and over again as we get deeper and deeper. You realize you're just beginning. So that's true. But I love what you're saying. Yes, we need to practice. And I'll tell you, without a practice, we become victims of our own life. We don't even realize we're victims. With a practice, we can't blame anybody or anything, not God, not others. We can't blame anybody because my practice is to discover more about who I am and all these are opportunities for me to practice. Mm. When I see I get really angry or I'm pissed off at this or I, I'm afraid of this or all this, you know, these things come up and we don't like them, I see it as grist for my mill. <laughs> you know, it's things that I work on and need to work on. And it gives me something to focus on that's lacking maybe in one way or another with me. So practice is absolutely essential. Yes, I, yeah. I'm. I'm really. I totally agree with it. I, I think, from my perspective, you, you've got to practice the practice until you become the practice, and and then, right. you know, right. then That's when right. when you're an 80 year old Roshi, you know, you can say <laughs> 79, maybe, 79. 79. <laughs> maybe maybe I don't need those. I can I can leave those right. That's right. That's right. That's right. No, and I'm glad you put it in perspective because. I'm more focused right now with my senior people that are ready to drop the rafts that are hanging on to it. I'm more focused on that than I have been with newer people coming into the practice. You know, I have other people doing that. So you're absolutely right. And thank you for bringing up the balance. Because and, and, and my pleasure. And how, how difficult is it for the senior people sometimes to let go of the raft? Is it possible? impossible see wow because you, you if you know and st you you get the forest instead of the you look at the trees instead of the, what is it the trees instead of the forest right you you make the raft be the objective or the or the practice be the objective versus the outcome of the practice and it's, how, it's, how do you pry the practice or the raft out from <laughs> under them if that's what you're doing go to prison <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, is there is there a nuance there of some sort? Or <laughs> you got you you got to fall. You got to let go. Talk so about some that. of us. Some of us have to fall. Talk about when that. Our pride, yeah, when our pride gets big enough, I had a great fall, as you remember, in eleven. You had your own fall. Um, you have to fall. Now, some may be able to descend gracefully. Mm. With a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> With a parachute. Those are the smart guys. I'm not one of them. I come tumbling down. Now, I feel like I've been working on that 
because that fall was an 11. And I had this profound thing happen a year ago. So what, what, what I was very conscious of this time was not having a great fall, but riding the wave all the way to shore and stepping off the board mm. rather than tumbled by the waves. And I, I kind of managed it. And, this and time. What, what specifically did you do to manage that? I watched how inflated I was getting. Mm. Because when you have amazing experiences, <laughs> they do inflate you. They're very fulfilling. They're very helpful, freeing, peace. But we attach to them. Those are the rafts. Once we have the experience, it now becomes a raft that got us here. So we, we say in Zen, don't hold on to the experience, not even great enlightenment. Because if you hold on to it, it becomes great delusion. Mm. So two things that help. Constantly own my delusion and constantly own my realization. Both. You don't do halfway. Halfway is neither here nor there. So extremes, we have to own every extreme. I am completely awake and I am completely deluded. And I see both. Mm. And I'm deluded in my enlightenment and I'm enlightened in my delusion. <laughs> that's that's a that's wow. a that's a hard game to play. Yes. You know, it, it really is. really is. It I'm reminded of of again in the Kabbalistic tradition, it says the union of opposites powers the universe. And that's and, it. That's it. Right? I mean That's the, in the Kabbalah. It is. It is. The dark and the light, the good and the bad, the you know mm. it's, but it's also in Taoism. Mm. I'm sure well, I'm sure it is. I yeah. it, it, it's, the light in the dark, the dark in the light. The in the young saying, right? There's light in the darkness, and there's darkness in the light. I once had my wife uh, uh, kind of lead me through, or, or, or uh, yeah, uh, facilitate me in the voice of light and in the voice of dark. And this was about three years ago in Maui. And it had been since 71 that I went completely into the light. That was my experience. And 71 was, I be completely became one with the light. And I know my attachment, my, my initial way of being or my way of being is I attach. <laughs> I think we're all that way, but I can see it myself. So I love the light. So I asked her to do me a favor. I said, I know if you bring me into the light and you ask to speak to the light, mm -hmm. I'm going to become very identified with the light and I'm not going to want to leave it. So I'm begging you right now, if you can swear to me that you will then ask to speak to my opposite, the dark, mm -hmm. and help me out of there because I am going to cling to the light. She said, I will do it on one condition. <laughs> <laughs> if you promise me that when I say move to the dark, you move, you jump. <laughs> and yeah. I did. I got blinded in the light. You, you don't see much when you're in the light. When you're one with the light, you don't see anything. It's just light. That's all. But there's more chance of their manifesting as dark. When I moved to the dark, actually, it was very liberating. Mm. That's what we avoid. We try to stay in the light or with the light or as the light. We want to ignore the dark. Well, what is dark? Dark is ignorance. Dark is the ignored. So we have to bring light to the dark. We can't. So we have to move into the dark and then shed light from the dark. So actually the dark is less dangerous in this case than attaching to the light and thinking you're God. Mm. Because that's where all the info in. Inf inflammation, not inflammation. Inf uh, yeah, infatuation with ourselves. Infatuate, yeah, yeah. It's seductive. It's very seductive. Very That's seductive. what I'm talking about. That's right. It's it's a great seduction, and, and, and absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, and we get drunk. It can be an escapism <laughs> too. Uh, an extreme. It is an escapism from the self and all the problems of the self. But it's it's even. Yeah, maybe more than escapism. Uh, we get so inflated, our ego becomes egoistic. I mean, we become 
I call it egohood. Instead of Buddhahood, we reached egohood. Mm. And that's where we have to fall from or come down from or somehow disengage from. We have to move away from the egohood. And so the way is to lose it all. You well, know, that's I'm, fascinating. So you're saying that the the light, ex- reaching light, can actually cause that. That's yeah, that's super fascinating. Ben, uh, you, no, you because lost. yeah, I know, I, I know. This all like went on inside, like, because to to have because I always thought okay, someone gets lost in their own thing, and I didn't think of it as. Someone has reached, like, let's say, absolute light, and they're operating from that. Therefore, they don't see anything else. That also could be, uh, uh, you know, d- d- wrong. And it's not, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's not complete. Well, it, it, it could be viewed as being dark, too, if you don't have the dark with you. That's, when- right. That's right. That's right. You're right. That's right. Wow. Yeah. That was, yeah. You know what I'm reminded of is um, Persiba is, I I think, you know, she does intuitive healing work. And, and so she's a go-to for me. We, we go to each other and we, we work with each other frequently. And I love that about you too. I just want to say, even just seeing you both up there together, gives me lots of ideas. I love it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So, um, hopefully they're they're light and dark, <laughs> not just. But anyway, I have dark. <laughs> nonetheless, I I have dark too. But nonetheless, she was doing a, a process with me, and and after this release work, you know, I I love to go, and and I start. It's like it just pulls. It's like I I I leave my body and. And she was going, uh, uh-uh, uh, no, 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 stay in your body, stay in, in inside. I was going, I don't want to stay in my body, okay? I want to, I want to go. This is amazing. I feel electric, and 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 that again, it's a great seduction. It it really can be. Um, wow. And the other thing that came up for me is in the book of Genesis and the creation mythology, it's all the all was dark and void first, and then God said, "Let there be light." So, so indicating in, in, at least in those traditions, that yeah. it's the dark that wow. is the foundation. I mean, we could almost say, couldn't we, that, that that's the dance between spirit and form. Well, I think you got it right when you said foundation. The way I see it, but it's a little conceptual, is um, there's the universe. Okay. <laughs> uh, and there's consciousness, there's a oneness, there's pure consciousness, pure mind, whatever we want to call pure energy, pure atoms. I mean, it's all one thing, right? The whole fabric of the universe is just one thing, right? So if this life, we're born, we live, we grow old, we die, hmm. is the trip and what is the journey? and that's an awesome what, question what's the how are you defining the difference between the trip and the journey how would you define it um i think you said the earth life is no i said tr- the trip and the journey what's the difference i'm I'm making this stuff up but, <laughs> but how, how do i yeah how, how do you view it difference? um i think how I would define it is the trip is the overall objective. The journey is the process of taking the trip. Oh. Okay. So I see it similarly. So I see that the journey is the journey of our soul or mm-hmm. spirit or whatever you want to, karma, whatever you want to call that, that which we can't really know so well, but we can be. Okay. So if the the journey is the journey of your soul, then this life is your trip. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So the soul's the journey is much bigger than the, the trip. trip. Yes. That's the way I see it. That the soul's journey is infinite. I mean, it's just much greater than this very life itself. Like this very life itself can be seen as very, very temporary. 
mm-hmm. like the dew drop on a morning blade of grass, but should be appreciated because it is that rare and that quick. This life, this trip is so short. Even if we live 100, 120 years, it's still short. When you get to the end, it feels really short. <laughs> At 79, it's feeling really short. Yeah. Right? Well, like how, many, how many good years do I have left, right? I'm still in very good shape. So how many good years? I mean, I've seen so many people in their 80s fall apart and die, or at least by their 90s. Very few that I've seen go to 100. So you start to realize your own mortality. And the trip is very quick. But the journey is huge. That's Indra's net. That's, that's the, the Tibetan knot of eternal knot. That's the uh, Celtic knot. Eternal. Yeah, it's... It, what, it's something that I, I really of, want to talk uh, about. Okay. Wait, no, go ahead. Go I was ahead. going to say, what are your thoughts on reincarnations? You well, believe? you know, I what I know and what I speculate, okay? What I know is this was not my first trip. <laughs> okay? I can't tell you about any other lifetimes. I don't know them particularly. I do know. I've been on them. I've had enough clarity and awakening to know this is not my first rodeo yeah. around. I also see in others that it's not their first rodeo. I see a lot of very, very wise people ready to open up, and it's not their first lifetime, for sure. Do I know anything about it? No. Mm. Do I know how I'm going to incarnate? No. Do I believe I will incarnate? Is something. I mean, that energy, what we call energy or we call it karma or whatever, is going to go on. It doesn't just stop like that because I'm dead. Something moves on. We see it. We see it in people who die. We feel it. We feel that something's moving on. I don't know where it's going or what it's going to be reborn as, but I know it's going to go on. That's what I know. Yeah. yeah. That, I, that totally makes sense to me. Yeah. If this is if this is one of the rafts you've already dropped, then then you can just you can just acknowledge that. But I'd really love there's so many people right now in the world, Gimpo, that are suffering. Yeah. I mean, there's there's just tremendous amount of people suffering economically, spiritually, emotionally. Yeah. I mean, the, I, there's never been a time in my lifetime. And I don't know. You're ahead of me. Well, yeah, but mine either. Where where there's been as much apparent, and I say that on intentionally, apparent chaos in the world. And so as I was thinking about our time here together, I I reflected back on the four noble truths, which is which are about translated as suffering, dukkha, you taught me is not really suffering, but but nonetheless dissatisfaction and you know, all that, yeah. Right, being out of harmony, and right. and so so as we talk to people about transmutation, and and taking what we have, and and utilizing it versus mm-hmm. being used by it, I'd, I'd love to hear your your take on the four noble truths, and 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 I don't know if you recall a conversation we had back during my my cosmic meltdown about the four noble truths and the way beyond suffering. And I didn't like your answer at the time, uh, <laughs> but I, I really see the wisdom in it now. So, so anyway, I, 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 you can talk about it much better than I, and maybe, maybe for the viewer, we, we explain what the four are. Yeah. Okay. So when the Buddha had his great enlightenment in his first sermon, when he came upon the people, the, the I think there were two or three men that accompanied him out of the palace, and he sat down and expounded the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path. And the first noble truth is that life is dukkha. And dukkha literally means stuck, like a wheel that something gets stuck in the spokes and it doesn't turn, or the axle doesn't turn. So it's a stuck wheel. So there's the wheel of life and death. And when that gets stuck and we get fixated, So there's on that wheel of life and death, there are many realms that we go through. You know, sometimes we we feel very godly and very inspired. And sometimes we feel like we're in hell. Sometimes we feel like killing somebody or 
hurting somebody. We're in the animal realm or we're in the Holy Ghost realm or the Holy Spirit realm. And, you know, we, we go into all these different realms. I think I said that wrong. I don't think it's the Holy Spirit. It's just the, the Holy realm. <laughs> Anyways, to be stuck, it's like a clock. If you clock is moving, it's fine. It's functional. If we get stuck at one or nine, it doesn't matter. It's stuck. So it doesn't matter where we get stuck, or what level of our development. If we're stuck, we're stuck. That's what he says is the cause of dissatisfaction, suffering, loneliness, you know, lamentation, all these things that affect us as a human being. So if we have a body, we have life, this body, otherwise we're disembodied. If we have a body, no life. We're going to suffer. We're going to have dissatisfaction. We're going to feel discontent. We're going to feel lonely. We're going to feel isolated. We're going to feel like crying, like losing, loss. So we're going to do all that. That is just life itself. What his teaching was, there's suffering and there is pain. Suffering is something we do on top of the pain. Mm. So we can do something about the suffering by being one with whatever the pain is. Mm -hmm. So if I have a backache, I could fight it, resist it, it just tenses up more and gets worse, and I need massage, and I need hot baths, and I need all these things to relax me. We can relax internally. We actually don't always need the physical. We can relax internally. We have to let go. What do we have to let go of is the suffering part of the pain, like I am suffering. So if we look, who is it that's suffering? I mean, if you look in right now and say, well, who is it that's hearing my voice? You don't find anything, do you? What do you find? Are you looking for an answer? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, you don't find anything, right? Oh, no. but, we, but we give an answer. We say, I am. Yeah. I am suffering. There's no I. So there's just pain. That's his teaching. Be the pain. Mm. Stop resisting it. When you resist or deny the pain, it only gets worse, magnifies. So stop resisting. This teaching is all about letting go, relinquishment. Let go and just be the pain. Don't, don't try to escape from it. When you are, the suffering dissolves and you're just, okay. You just have pain. So that's the first. The second, there's a cause for the suffering. And the cause of the suffering is grasping, grabbing hold. That's what we do as human beings. We're constantly grasping, grabbing hold, and trying to define things, understand things, make things, make things disappear, make things happen. With all that, what he's saying is the grasping quality, if you can cease grasping, how do you do that? You let go of grasping. When you seek grasping, the suffering stops. He also said the third is that there is a way beyond the suffering. Mm -hmm. And that way is the full path, not to do harm or kill, not to lie or steal, you know, all these different things that uh, are the, I think the first one is right view, right, under, uh, right view, right perception, Right th thinking or thoughts, right words, right livelihood, right action, right livelihood, right samadhi, right wisdom. If you follow that, it leads you to enlightenment. Mm. But now in Zen, we go a step further. So what is right understanding? If you try to figure that out, what realm are you in? The conceptual, good and bad, right and wrong. Right understanding versus wrong understanding. No, right understanding is no understanding at all. <laughs> if you have no understanding, right understanding. I, I love the way you both received that. <laughs> what hit you, James? Um, I was thinking about, uh, actually, a quote from Socrates um, <laughs> came up for me where he said, um, I measure the quality of the questions I ask by the ones to which I know I have no answer, um, which is is similar, similar of, you know, the more the more I think I understand, the more I realize I don't understand anything. That's right. That's right. That's that's it. 
in a nutshell. Yeah. 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 So that's the, the, the four noble truths. And as a viewer, you're really blessed to hear it from, from Roshi because, um, yeah. You know, if you if you read them, which I did when I was 18, I got the Buddhist Bible and I started reading, you know, the Eightfold Path. I I love it. It's it's very virtuous and it's it's um, and as you so aptly define Zen even takes it further. And yet if mm-hmm. you pr- it, those are maybe the practices, the rafts, if you will, right speaking, right thinking, That's you know, right. all That's those right. things. Um, uh bring you to right to right living that's to, right and experiencing that's right. that's right and so we see the teachings as also you could say scaffolding or crutches that we need the right teaching until we embody it and we don't need it any longer and we cast away the crutches because the leg has healed so we only need the teachings until we don't need the teachings any longer. Now, it's dangerous if we decide we don't need the teachings before we don't need the teachings. That's right. <laughs> but we have to be honest and integrous with ourselves. And, and, it, I, and that's I, part I, of the wisdom of having a teacher, too. That's right. To, to that's say, right. say, no, no, not, hang on, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. That's right. It's a hard one as a teacher. I would imagine. Of course, every student wants to be affirmed. Right. You can't affirm if you're if you're ethical. You can't affirm them unless they're ready. Not everybody's going to realize they're affirmed either, or, or, or they're ready. So you're going to run into that. But yes, you can't affirm them if they're not there yet. You still need the, the, the crutches. Right. So... This conversation, we could go on forever. I want to be respectful of your time. I want to ask one one last question, and then I want you to tell people how they can get in touch with you because I'm pretty sure they're they're going to want to. If they if they don't, I I don't understand. Okay. Of course, I don't understand. I've just learned that I don't understand anything. But but I have, not, I have a final question but, too. Oh, you do. I do. Okay. Well, we're <laughs> going to ask it. Go, go ahead. No, you go first. Um, no, I want to, I think this is a good final question. So oh, it is. Okay. Oh, okay. So I would say from, from your experience of this lifetime, if you could combine it all into one, your biggest takeaway, what, what is it? Hmm, that's good. Thanks. You know, what comes up, stay open, <laughs> but we don't always know when we're not. So take advice from your loved ones. Listen. <laughs> right relationship. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because, yeah, because we do not see ourselves very clearly. Let's face it. Uh, so we have to trust the opinions of those we trust. Yeah. In other words, if I knew James, I would trust Bear. I trust Charlotte. I, I trust if she says to me, you know, you're getting inflated again. Mm. I don't say, no. <laughs> I say, oh. What do you see? How are you seeing it? How are you picking it up? Because I haven't noticed it yet. Well, you, you, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Because I know um, if I ignore it, I'm going down a very slippery slope. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say. It, 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 takes, a, it takes a certain level of, of self-confidence to be confident enough to accept that, too. Mm-hmm. I, I think sometimes... Sure. It's taken me about 79 years. <laughs> you know, where we are in our evolutionary process, we 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 have a hard time swallowing that. But yeah. but I, I think um yeah, married life has has been amazing for me because it's it you, you can really fool yourself into being a Buddha when you're sitting in your living room by yourself, you know. <laughs> um but then you know you yeah. get into relationship. So so here's here's the question I'd like to ask you. And do you, and and this is something that can be come up from two angles, I believe. Mm. But do you believe that the spiritual path, if we want to call it that, for lack of a better term, the path of awakening, whatever we want to label it, mm-hmm. is easier or harder mm-hmm. than the non-spiritual path? Okay, I think it's an excellent question. First of all, um, I would say this. 
I would say if we don't have a path, then our life is pretty meaningless, even though we think it's very meaningful. If we're not on a path, if we're not serving something greater than oneself, if we're, I, I mean, I see certain physicians, I see nurses, I see doctors, I see lawyers, I see all kinds of people really serving something greater than themselves. And I see an awful lot of people only serving themselves, but it's me, my, and mine. Mm -hmm. So having a spiritual path may be more difficult, but I think in the end, it's a lot better way to live life. I feel like it takes time to reap the fruits of your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Now that I've been doing it for more than a half a century, I feel I'm reaping the benefits, the fruits. I have a very, very wonderful life. I feel very blessed. And I, I feel like I couldn't, I don't deserve it all. I mean, it's just, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know if I could have got there staying Dennis Merzel, water polo swimmer, lifeguard <laughs> teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them are dead now or not doing so well. Mm -hmm. So I would say in the end, the spiritual path in a way may be more difficult, may be easier. It's not the point. It's absolutely essential if we're going to have a full, complete life. If we are satisfied with an incomplete, unfulfilled, imperfect life, then don't get on the path. But if you want to experience the completeness, the fullness of yourself, the, the, the truth of who you are, then you get, a, you get on the path. It isn't, and nice. a couple of spinoffs, that's, that's beautiful, a couple of spinoffs from that. Isn't it, in effect, or in actuality, um, harder in the grand scheme to have the life that doesn't have have the meaning, the purpose, the path. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, you come to we're all going to come to the end of this physical mm -hmm. life and look back and and say, "Hey, did I did I give enough? Did I grow enough? Did I contribute, or or did was it just me and mine?" To use your words, and and that that I think could be harder in the long run. Absolutely. So, if yeah. you're going to use harder and easier, I agree totally. So second question, it took you, you said, better part of 50 years to start reaping the benefits of your practice. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Yeah, well, and, but I, I exaggerate slightly. I'm going by, okay, in the last year or two. But really, it's been, frankly, I think to, since 2016, so it's been more like seven years that I really feel after my fall in 2011, I had to process it all. I had to drop a lot of things. I had to look at myself very honestly. You know, you were part. I had to really look at how I inflated and got very, very inebriated with my own power. I was able to empower others. And that's a very powerful thing to get attached to, empowering others. I got completely inebriated. I was drunk with that power. And I did things I shouldn't have done. Simple as that. I, I knew better. But I did them because I was feeling very inflated. So I would say that by 16, I had gone through a process of relinquishing a lot of things that I had been attached to, throwing out a lot of things in my life that weren't working and bringing in things that were and people that were helpful to me so yeah I, I would say about the last seven years that's 45 years of practice yeah it takes time one of the first things my teacher said to me was realization or insights are always sudden and immediate they're right there but to actualize to embody them to live them takes time it just takes time so here's here's the uh, epidemic in today's world, and I'd love some advice for our viewer because here's what we consistently experience, and and I'm sure you have as much, if not more, is that there's so much desire for instant gratification mm -hmm. and this fast fame, magic bullet secret sauce yeah. and so so many people come in you know roaring to go 
and then they fizzle out quickly. What was it, Kempo, in you that kept you going all those years to get to this point? If you had to give advice to a viewer, what 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 develops that that persistence and that consistency? Okay, two things are coming up. One is the voice is perseverance. <laughs> okay, uh, you 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 have to persevere. Uh, but the other is the initial opening for me was a kind of compassion for all beings. I mean, not kind of, it was a love of all beings. And that's what's driven me is to do my best to awaken people out of the realm of fear mm. and into the realm that is beyond that, where life is much more joyful and happy and mm. we're, we're less stuck and we're just more free. So it's wanting that out of that initial experience to know I am all those beings. I'm not separate from them. Uh, every sentient being that's suffering, including animals, insects even, it's very hard to separate myself from them. I can see the difference. I can see I'm me and they're there, they're them. But I can't really separate myself from their pain and their suffering. I can't. It's, so that drives you. Mm -hmm. So there's always, there's always even in the most fullest enlightenment, liberation, nirvana, there's still a little bit of something there that is itching, that is a kind of sadness, or you can say for the conditions of, of life itself, mm -hmm. for the actual conditions of this life, because it is full of yeah, suffering mm -hmm. for most. Yes, it is, and, and very much so right we now can't deny that we can't deny that it's so true so look i we could talk to you all day and and i want to be respectful of your time this has yes. been brilliant. Time is fine. i'm fine but go ahead yeah this has been brilliant and, and as always and it's it's so i'm so grateful to have to have yeah. this time with you and to be able to share you and a portion of the impact you've made on me and on us with with our viewers and so how if someone were to want to get in touch with you or to work with you or or any of those things what's the best way to do that well on bigmind.org it shows our schedules and all that and you can also <laughs> go on on bigmind.org or on um on uh, what's it called uh anyways you can look it up We'll, we'll, we'll put, put, we'll put all the information in, down below. So, um, Gimpo, so much love to you, so much respect for you, yeah. uh, so much gratitude, and this was the best um, likewise, likewise, guys. Likewise. Yeah, it's it's been it's been one of the best conversations we've had in a long, long time. So, uh, God bless you, and and let's uh, we'll do this again. Thank you, guys. You you both look. Really great. <laughs> I'm doing really well. Thank you. Love you guys. We feel blessed. God yeah. bless. Yeah.